Thank you both so much for this really beautiful film. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Also a very fun film. Um, so I wondered if you could start us off by speaking a bit about your collaboration. I know the two of you have worked together in other ways before. Um, this is the first feature narrative film for both of you as directors. Um, how did you come to make this work together and curious about the way, you know, Mika has the editing credit and you have the screenwriting credit, but both of you came up with the story together. So curious to hear you speak about how you work together. <laughs> a lot of silence, a lot of silence, a lot of, silence. <laughs> a lot of um, inner meditation. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> we, we, you know, we, started, we started talking, really. Uh, the first week of the pandemic, Mika called and said, you know, we'd met, I guess we'd met 17 years before that, and I guess no. Well, 17 years from before now. And uh, Mika called first week of the pandemic, and was like, all right, let's, you know, we, we said we we're going to make a movie 17 years ago, let's do it now, maybe. And we'd been talking about stuff before that, but, you know, pandemic sort of solidified it, we started having a conversation. Good. And that conversation has led to this. Yeah, I mean, it started with like, let's do something really small and remotely. That's Actually, right. the year before we met, and that was before remote was a thing, and before more, the pandemic. Yeah. Before the pandemic, yeah. and for more, um, I was thinking about not wanting to travel so much and kind of reducing the footprint of the studio and production. So this idea of shooting a whole movie around the world but staying in one place uh, remotely. And that was like, okay, maybe the, uh, let's think about it. And then, then everything turned to be remote. And then that seemed like, okay, let's do a movie remotely. And after we started thinking about the story, we realized we're both kind of control freaks and we don't want to, we actually want to be there for the occasion and we don't want to do anything remotely. Um, so we said, okay, let's do it in the back of my house. That's also the studio upstate, which was like a barn to build sets and all that. So, and we wanted to do something very small and fun and, and then we got too excited and it became a bit bigger <laughs> and then the budget you know, added a zero to it. <laughs> and we were both like, okay, I guess we were too invested at that point to give up. Um, so then this happened. <laughs> and I think we both kind of felt like it um, provided an escape in a way uh, for the first year of the pandemic and everything else that was going on. It was almost like you see, like we were just talking about, you know, shampooing dogs and all these other things and then all these things are happening in the background um, as we were going and so yeah there we are <laughs> um, I'm curious because a lot of it also takes place in this kind of virtual space that you know was clearly kind of made in post-production so I'm curious kind of the back and forth between thinking through that virtual space that the actors are obviously alluding to in their motions and things like that, and then working in the physical space, and if that was all pre-planned, or if some of it, you know, you kind of um, developed more in post-production, and kind of, yeah, the back and forth between the physical aspects and the, the more digital. I think as we were conceiving it, it was obvious that this is going to be a nightmare to make because we both know what special effects mean. And especially no budget special effects and it's so tedious because, you know, when you have one line of, of uh, editing, it's one thing, but when you have like 50 lines of, you know, it's very hard to, to make any adjustments and all that. So we were kind of, we knew that we were writing something that's going to be really, really um, tedious to make. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, was, you know, it was quite detailed. So we we'd, we'd really conceived a lot and wrote everything in detail up front because you have to, in order to actually get the things you need, even though so much of it is in a digital space, you need interactions between these two worlds for it to work. And so, so much of it had to be conceived, but so much of it also we had to figure out as we're going forward. And 
and I think you know there's so many layers to this film, both in terms of the textures that you see, but also in terms of sort of how these textures interact with each other and interact with the world. And so some of those was discovered, um, um, and some of them was planned. And look, I think that if we hadn't figured out a lot up front, it would have been a difficult film to make. You know, I think those conversations in that first year, you know, it was surprising. Like, you know, you don't write scripts in, I mean, I think, you know, we had a treatment by, by August of 2020, we had a first draft of a script by December, so three months scripts are not a thing. I don't know, how, you know, you don't write scripts in three months, it's just not a thing. Um, but so we had figured out a lot. In, in those conversations, and so, but he never stopped. You know, I think some of the crews here, and <laughs> they will tell you that we were writing scripts yeah. way past we should have been. You know, we were you know, drafts and drafts were coming in even as we were just about to start. And um, yeah, but I think let's just point out. So it's a good number of the crew members are here. You all want to stand up? Where's everybody? The post physical. Come on. Stand up. No, no, not your hands. Come on, Katrine. You can. There you go. Come on, come on, everyone. everyone. Chad, where are you? Chad, where are you? Not standing up. <laughs> Chad's like the tallest person is not standing up. <laughs> Damon, where are you? Damon? Count. God, there's more people here that are being shy about standing up. And you met the four cast members who are here who, I mean, I don't think this film would have been made without the performances. You know, it was very difficult for them, so, because they have to work alone. And, uh, you know, doy. <laughs> uh, we couldn't make, you know, we had to write and direct a film and an actor in Korean, which was not easy. <laughs> because our Koreans are not that good, if you can imagine. So, yeah, it's a, it's a team effort. So, you know, there was a lot of work, obviously, to figure it out, but then without the crew and without the cast, you know. And then, you know, post-production, obviously, so there's a good amount of post-people here as well. No, Mashir made it, but, yeah. Thank you all. So, yeah, um, I'd love to hear more about your work with the actors um, and the casting. Casting. Yeah, casting, Damien, Damien, come on, Damien, you have to stand up now. No, no, this, you're literally being called out. So Damien Bow, the great Damien Bow, the casting director. Um, yeah, I mean, we, 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 you know, it was a pretty. We saw a lot of people. Uh, well, digitally, remotely, saw a lot of people. Um, watched a lot of videos and narrowed it down and narrowed it down until we, you know, ended up with the, you know, with the people that that we wanted to work with and and. You know, and it's, you never know. And it's not like at this budget you have an opportunity to recast or anything like that. So we got very lucky. Um, we got the performances that we did and the schedule that we had. So it was pretty amazing. Um, working uh, on set was a different ballgame entirely because normally, you know, with, you know, with the exception of Junie at the end where she's got, a, you know, a, another actor on set with her. Um, and she was very happy about that. <laughs> Once that happened, she was like, thank God, it was the last thing she shot, and she was like, she was so lonely, because she had to do all of this crazy stuff, um, you know, with a crew that's just sort of focusing on recording it and you know, giving her nothing back, you know. Um, but, you know, so, so it, it was a scenario where we had to really figure out how do you work with the actors on set, and there was a lot of, um, you know, I, I played scene part quite a bit. You know, um, <laughs> so it was nice. That's like, you know, many things made it very nice for this to be a collaboration because I don't think we could have made this film individually. And that was one of them where, you know, Mika could be watching the screen and I could literally be sitting on set having a conversation with the actors as we were walking through it, you know. Yeah, I remember we when we did the, our sound person was like, we really hear well the one actor, but the other actor we can hardly hear. <laughs> I was like, okay, thank God. <laughs> the other actor was The other me. actor was <laughs> it's you um, doing that, so. <laughs> Curious to hear more about the story structure, um, particularly you just mentioned, you know, this really interesting perspectival shift at the end when we 
go to her um, Injun's apartment at the end um, after everyone discovers their fingernails. So I just because the rest of the film is so contained um, in in the first apartment. So I just wondered if you could talk a bit about just the general structure, story structure, um, and also kind of these really key moments and the shifts in the story. Um, so yeah, this, so the story is in, is, is in four acts. I don't know if you can tell, but uh, it's, it takes place in five days in four acts. And you know, Mika, and Mika can speak about it herself, but if you've been lucky enough to see Mika's work, um, it's remarkably visual and it's quite spatial. Um, and uh, the exciting part for me, and we had worked together as you mentioned before, so we already had this shorthand around some of the work. And so the exciting part for me was to figure out, all right, how do we structure a story that maintains the spatiality of Mika's work, uh, but at the same time introduces a timeline narrative and a story, a simple story, but a layered story into that without uh, stepping on top of it with you know that sort of in a way um, that they vibe together in a way that they that they work together and and the I've for a long time been quite enamored by a, a poetry form um, there's a Chinese poetry form called Kisha Dengetsu which you would most likely be familiar with from the Japanese filmmaking anime uses it a lot uh, Miyazaki uh, is the most popular form of Kisha Dengetsu that you would see but you could see it in novels again, in poetry, um, and it's a four-act structure that has a very sort of linear rise, um, and then it sort of does its own thing at the end. It's got, you know, it's sort of where it deviates from one to the next, and you have some freedom as to how you can sort of, um, but that felt like the right structure from a script perspective, and, and sort of that's the way the script was structured. Um, and it allowed for this very patient build that was really important because we wanted it to, to really feel organic to the experience that of sort of living at home and having a routine and etc. And you know, we, we were very inspired from the beginning with Jean Dillman uh, to Chantal Ackerman's film. Was it a three and a half hour film? That one, yeah. That kitchen shot, right? Is a yeah, reference, it's very right? Much a, yeah. The tiles in the back, yeah. but it's flipped, I think. Yeah, it's kind of a little bit making fun <laughs> with <Very> it. <laughs> um, yeah, because I think oh, for me it was interesting. To, to play with plot and narrative, but in a way that kind of messes with the viewer. It's never about this uh, bubble of a story. It's always a story is between the expectation of the viewers and uh, maybe kind of like more like a lynching kind of moment of you, the story kind of happens or the energy happens between the viewers and, the, and whatever happens on the screen. Um, so that shift of, uh, was interesting to find a, that moment. Um, yeah. um, I'd love to hear you speak about the language, the use of language in the film. Yeah. I mean, I think for me personally, it was verbal language is not my most uh, go-to kind of language. Um, <laughs> it's never not about really what people say; it's about what they do. Um, that's what I so, tell my kids all the time. Right. <laughs> it doesn't work. Right. <laughs> so to actually have someone, um, and I think we kept having conversations about the difference between creating a fictional character and um, what you give to the actor and coming more from the art kind of performance maybe, you know, video art background, it's, you don't give someone any fictional, they are what they are, and they, you give them tasks, and they do things, but they don't, it's almost a bit like, kind of down looking at, uh, like a fiction, because it's about the real. So it was, you know, a little difficult for me to think about creating a pure fiction that exists within itself, because it's really about, uh, again, the relationship, the creating the fiction, and, and breaking the, popping the fiction, and um, so I was really into, okay, if I ever direct a movie in language, it has to be kind of languages that I don't quite understand, and about not understanding languages, or this gap of understanding. So I was really comfortable, actually, um, you know, directing in Korean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it, it was, we also were very intentional about the fact that we wanted 
you know, this film is set in the future, and so then if you're going to set, set a film in the future, what are the things you can say about that future? And there was, you know, we had a lot of conversation about the fact that um, a lot of times when people tell stories about the future, they take it a little bit too seriously. Uh, where in reality we we're, we are living in science fiction. We are in the future right now, and you know we're still sitting in seats and eating popcorn out of you know you know and watching films. And you know your homes are still quite analog as well as digital. And and that it's not like you suddenly wholesale turn into a different society where nothing analog exists unless it's a token. You know, and so there was this idea of uh, of the past and the future, but there was we were very we were thinking pretty hard about what is it about this future that's interesting that we want to talk about. And part of it was, okay, this notion, as Mika says, like sort of this throwback to the 90s version of a global village and what that actually means, you know, if, if, if ultimately technology can sort of break down some barriers around language, then does that allow for us to find these shared aspirational communities elsewhere where we're not bounded by language and then people from very different backgrounds can connect around certain things and and so this was always you know from the beginning like the idea of making a film remotely was because we wanted to make a film about characters that were in different parts of the world uh, we didn't know what languages there were going to be uh, that had to do with casting once we cast the film then we're like okay so these are the languages because you had to find and thank god for new york that you can find you know amazing ca actors who can speak multiple languages and who can embody these characters. Um, so it was it was that. But also we really wanted to, to make a film that really messed with this English domination, where it made English speakers feel uncomfortable about not having to understand everything, and also introduce language. And, and essentially, you, if you're an English speaker, you can understand what you can read, and you can understand what you can hear, but not necessarily everything. Um, and it's we would have liked to have done that more, but couldn't unfortunately yeah try. then it was kind of shooting ourselves in the foot because then we realized if we have to subtitle it that it has to be english dominant because you have to subtitle it to like <laughs> one perspective um and so still it's impossible to subtitle you know except for that end piece you know yeah i think the way that you work with the translations through the little uh, bubbles of text you know works really right. well because you're hearing them speak it in their own language and then you're seeing the translation that's yeah, in it. What's it a stone kind of a language? Yeah, app. and what's interesting <laughs> is that we're reading it not like for us as subtitles, but as like the character is reading it, you know? So I, I really love the way. Yeah, I think that. at some point we were like, okay, we both commonly speak English, so it should be probably an English speaking movie. <laughs> but that came a little late. But also the, the near future came. A little later. I think it was a lot about like a connection to a geographical location and a disconnect from it or something. And I like, can't remember. Yeah, it was about <laughs> like connectivity and, and, and connection to a place and a lack of connection to a place or something yeah. like that. And then, and then things kind of piled on. Let's open up to questions. I'm sure there are some from the audience. Or maybe not. Oh. <laughs> nothing, nothing. <laughs> Um. Sometimes it takes a little time for people to get comfortable. Here's one. Um, I think we actually realize that we don't need to speak anymore. <laughs> um. I mean, I think it was a magical moment where, okay, what happens, like, when once they break this moment? From the beginning, we, we kind of, the uh, beginning point was uh, about the mycelium and how this network and how technology is magic in a way, uh, and it is kind of t speaking in telepathy. This is a way that, I, I, you know, you almost feel like, I almost feel like I, I'm connected to so many people in all these places. and. Um, it is like it is magic. I don't understand exactly how it works, uh, and yeah. So I, the, just uh, and I think this uh, collapse of geography and all that 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 happened, and then that they they actually are able to break that. It's like a new AG kind of grand finale. 
thing. <laughs> it's a, the sequel is embedded in the ending. But the, um, oh, or the Pentipus end is one thing. The yeah. Pentipus is a, that's a yeah. different thing. But the, the telepathy was... Um, so I think kind of 90s new age, maybe. Yeah, I mean, or... or, 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 or Still, now, I mean, now new age. I mean, new age yeah. is new age. Look, I think the 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 uh, you know the, the film is in so many ways about connection, right? And it's about connecting different ways and different layers of connection, and and ultimately sort of this idea of physical connection, which is sort of where we get to at the end. That's um, that's not necessarily what they're after, but it's what they find, um, and. Um, and it was, you know, I, th I think there, there was this notion of, like, a, um, um, this idea of observation. So if, if they're going to do something, then who sees it? Who observes it? You know, and so that, I think, was a, was, was a question. And sort of, you know, you know, if you don't see, if something is not seen, then is it, is it, did it happen? And, and so, so there was there was that part of it, and there's the same layers exist within the within the women. There's a symmetry, you know. It's a pentapus, it's not an octopus. So it's five legs, you know. So if you'd observe that, and um, you know, and so so there is there is a symmetry to it. And I, but I think we we don't necessarily want to talk too much about the end because because at the end of the day, it's really about what you make of it. Um, and it, and you know, the, the second you start talking about it, then you start. Um, you know, then you make it about one thing, and if you're lucky, you make something where the, the where the ending can have different meanings for different people, and and mm -hmm. so, it, and so why why break that magic part of it, you know? So, but we also wanted to make it like pure sci-fi in the end. I think we wanted to shift different structures, and then in the end, we we had to like, have it, and as that, and as a cartoon or animation. To kind of flip it one more, one more time. Any questions? Yes. I think there's about five people on, on the range of uh, the feminine, maybe, or you know, range of. Um, of that. I don't know if it was, um, it seems obvious that if someone would kind of come together and break into like a next dimension, they should be probably on that range, maybe. Um, <laughs> it was not that much. I mean, for me, it was a lot more about the five women. You know, I think that was the interesting part. You know, so I told you, it was very much for me. The future is female, and and so this film was about about, about these women. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think look, we, you know, that's what collaboration is like. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know, the 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 texture of the film, the idea of connection. Um, um, the, the quality of connection, it's something that I think is uh, um, is a lot more on the feminine scale than it is on a masculine scale, you know. Um, uh, and so I, I don't know if I could have written this film if there was a dude in there, you know, because writing is not something where you can force a scenario. Yeah, you can certainly put a guy in that situation and have him go through these, but I, I, I couldn't write it. It would, I, it would, the story would take a different turn the second you introduce that energy. Um, so yeah, for me, it was very much about these, that's the only way I could s get through the script um, and, and get through these sort of movements. Yeah, um, I think we also wanted to make something optimistic because we also made it through the precisely. pandemic, through the, the elections, <laughs> and just like, okay, like the future, you know, who is gonna like, are we gonna, it's, it has to be about kind of coming together and kind of breaking something, um, so. Speaking of women, I think I should just take a moment and say this. So I grew up in Iran, um, and I went to first grade during the revolution, and um, and it was you know it's a crazy wild experience of doing that. And, it, and a year later, um, the revolution became the Islamic Republic, and I remember 
uh, my mom's a school teacher and I, I we went you know I was in elementary school and so we went to school together and we drove out of our street and took a left turn and uh, not, it was my mom's fault but we got in a car accident and then I remember my head banged into the passenger seat window and and um, the driver some guy came out and he sort of went around the back of his car and came to the front and my mom left and she's like, you okay? I was okay. You know, and she came and she came to the front and right when they, as, right as they met in front of me, and I should just give you a precursor, like my mom is a badass. You know, she was very much the matriarch of the family, um, the lioness in many ways. And as soon as they met right in front of the car, he slapped her right in the face. Oh. Um, and that's when I knew sort of the Islamic Republic had landed in Iran and sort of shattered my sort of image of what it was to be in a safe environment and the reality of what had just happened as if the revolution itself wasn't traumatic enough. Um, and in this moment, uh, I don't know how many years are later, are we 42 years later, the grandchildren of, of that generation of women are fighting back or they're slapping back this regime. Um, and um, it's hard for the media and the powers that be to digest it because they can't believe it. They're so used to this policy of containment of the Islamic Republic that they just can't imagine a future without them. And I think this is the first recorded uh, revolution led by women ever. It's a big deal. Um, and they're young girls, um, they're young women, um, they are old women, mothers, grandmothers who are out there um, and they're being supported by not just, you know, by people from across the specter. And it's a huge, huge thing. It's a big, big story. And the media doesn't know how to cover it. And, you know, all of the politicians who for years have talked about how the Islamic Republic is a problem somehow have lost their voice now that they're doing their worst. Um, and I just want to say this because I think it's important in this sort of conversation around women and why women, because I truly believe the future, if we're going to have one, that's even remotely as optimistic as our film, it's got to be, it's a future that will be found by women. Um, and, and those women right now, not, for, you know, in, at a time when democracy is, is going backwards, I mean, I don't know if you know the data, but democracy is has basically all of sort of the hype that came around the fall of the Berlin Wall um, and around liberalism and democracy is gone. So we are pre-Berlin, pre-Soviet collapse, popularity for democracy and liberalism in the world. Um, Sweden just elected a, a far-right leader, Italy. You know, we know what's going on here. We know what's going on in England. And this is happening elsewhere as well. And in this moment, the front line of the war for democracy and liberalism is taking place in Iran. And it's taking place by young Iranian schoolgirls. And they're not just fighting for themselves, but they're fighting for all of us uh, because we're losing it here. And, um, and it's important that we pay attention. So I just want to share. Yeah, I think it was the idea of obs observation, right? So the thing, the, the, I think, it's, at least for me, um, there's a concept in quantum mechanics where a thing is not real until it's observed. And so it was about, again, this notion of who's going to observe the phenomenon. Um, and it's not until she looks through it that the thing actually begins to happen. You know, they're sitting there with their figure in the wall, like, waiting for something to happen. It's not until Unji gets up and sees what looks inside that uh, that is the catalyst, if you would, for uh, whatever is happening at the end. Um, so yeah, so that's that's that was I think in part that was the reason. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for this beautiful film. <laughs>